I just think um, that we've truly found something that we really love. Um, I, it, it's really one of the hardest, certainly one of the hardest physical jobs I've ever had. And I just see no end to that. I hope I'm doing it until I can no longer bend over and pick the flowers. This is The Producers. I'm Anthony Huckstep. For farmers Angela and Brendan Argyle of Argyle Australian Saffron, location was vital for the success of their foray into saffron. The regional New South Wales town Orange is perfect for saffron, which demands four distinct seasons to thrive. And as Angela discovered, a hell of a lot of grit and determination too. Uh, we live in a little place called Lidster, which is just outside Orange, about 15 k's out of Orange. There's four really distinct seasons in Orange, like you can nearly flick a switch to the seasons here on the day. Um, and Saffron loves the very, very cold, so it always, almost needs to drop below zero for Saffron to flower. So Orange is great for that and really dry um, preferably hot summers um, when the bulbs are dormant so that they get nice and dry and ready to flower again for the next season. So the weather and the climate here is perfect and um, we're also very fortunate to live on the foothills of Mount Canobles and our soil um, is just beautiful. I've never lived anywhere that uh, anything will grow that you put in the ground here really. We've just got beautiful volcanic soil a lot of grape. We all surrounded by vineyards and orchards, of course, in Orange. Um, but yeah, we're very fortunate to have beautiful soil here too. With a lifelong ambition to get back to their country roots, in 2016, Angela and Brendan packed up and moved their lives to Orange in regional New South Wales. My husband Brendan and I moved out to Orange after 20 years in Sydney. Um, and it was sort of always our intention to farm something eventually um, and we hadn't really decided what that was um, but we only have a 10 acre property so it's not big and uh, we were actually watching Landline one day and saw Tazsaf who are the biggest growers in Australia they're down in Tasmania and I thought hmm, I know nothing about saffron literally I don't think I'd ever cooked with it um, but the story fascinated me and I sort of thought well Safra, uh, the, sorry, the climate in Tasmania is really similar to Orange. Um, so I actually, the next day, just called them. <laughs> I called Taz Saf and said, um, talk to me a bit about saffron, which I actually thought was pretty bold of me at the time when I think back to just make that cold call. But, um, yeah, and they were amazing. They just, um, and still are to this day, have really helped to teach us because, like I said, we had no experience whatsoever. Um, I grew up on a, a cattle farm out past Tamworth, um, so I had a little bit of farming experience. It was certainly very different to saffron. Um, so, yeah, then we, we got talking to them. We did soil testing with their help um, and determined that what we suspected was true, that our soil was really well suited to saffron and certainly the orange climate, like I mentioned before, is perfect for it. Um, and, yeah, there are a few other reasons it appealed to us, I guess. we um, Saffron lasts indef indefinitely if it's stored properly, so we sort of figured – if we grow it and don't sell any, then, then we, it'll always just sit in the jars. And um, so that wasn't really a, a, going to be an issue for us. And also that you don't need a lot of um, expensive heavy plant or equipment because everything with saffron's manual. Um, and we didn't really have that startup capital, to be honest. So, yeah, so for those, those and a couple of other reasons, we took the plunge and bought our first, I think we just bought 2,000 bulbs from Tasmania and did our first little trial run and that was amazing. So we kicked off from there. We have the first flower that we harvested still with the stigma in it. Um, but the funny story is that it's pressed in a book somewhere in our house and we don't know which book it's in. 
So one day we're going to have to go back and go through all our big books. I'm sure it's in a big heavy book. But um, yes, I absolutely remember the first flower. It was beyond exciting, uh, which is why we pressed it and <laughs> now it's lost somewhere in a book. It was just just amazing and so exciting. We didn't know what to do with it. We brought it down to the house and went, right, so we take the centre out and what do we do next? When we were first planting, when we decided, right, we're going to be saffron farmers and bought another sort of 50,000 corms from down in Tasmania and had to get them hand planted in the ground. And at that time we had um, a two-year-old and a newborn baby and day jobs um and we still do have day jobs and young kids so to get those in the ground we would you know come come down cook dinner for the kids bath them and put them to bed and then brendan and i would put head torches on and go up in the paddock on our hands and knees and we've got photos of us um with those head torches on planting like sixty thousand set front corns and you know, at the time, it was sort of a mixture of this is crazy. What are we doing? Like, we're both exhausted with a newborn baby and a little toddler, and we're up here with head torches on doing something we know nothing about. Um, but in hindsight, that's uh, such a, I'm actually getting a little emotional thinking about it. It's such a um, special memory because, and, and I'm sure is now why. Um, Everything we do, we really feel it. Every sale we make, we feel it. Every, like, the Delicious Award that we've just won was totally emotional for us because we really have done it from that first, you know, two weeks with head torches on, just us up in the paddock at 9 o'clock at night. So, yeah, that, that's probably one of my favourite moments just because it's really where we started. As an ingredient that adds depth and a vibrant colour to a dish, Saffron has become renowned as one of the most expensive ingredients on the planet. But what is saffron? So saffron is the little red stigma from the center of the crocus, certificus flower, um, and it's dried. And once it's dried, it just looks like a beautiful little deep maroon strand. And to cook with it, you can either use it whole, so you soak those strands in, in a warm liquid and add it to your cooking, or you can grind it to a powder and, and use it in your cooking. So, But a lot of people know it as a spice, but not a lot of people actually realise, especially when I show them photos of the beautiful purple flowers that they come out of, that it actually comes from a flower. And that's why, so to make a gram of saffron, takes about 220 flowers so you've got to pick 220 flowers and strip them to make a gram which is about a little lip gloss container full of saffron <laughs> saffron farming is laborious every single step of the process to produce just one gram of saffron is done by hand and that one gram comes from about 220 flowers yeah look i think um when we first started i would have said well, saffron's special because it's um, it's beautiful to eat in your cooking um, and, you know, there's a variety of dishes you can use it in, but I'm sort of learning that it's just got so many other applications. Um, so, yeah, certainly it's cooking's probably its most common use and I cook with saffron, I would say, nearly every day in different applications. Um, but more and more we're getting a lot of... Um, our customers use saffron medicinally, um, so there's been some pretty exciting recent trials finalised um, which showed that saffron's as effective as Ritalin for ADHD um, and we have a lot of customers now who take our saffron daily for um, things like Alzheimer's, uh, depression, macular degeneration um, and we've actually got one customer who takes it for um, a brain injury she had and one of the most amazing things is that she she updates this regularly and as that said that she's improved dramatically in the last 12 months and you know of course we can't really pinpoint that necessarily to the saffron but it's it's quite special in that we're starting to realize some of some of the other uses that we never really knew about that have huge impact um and 
cosmetically. So we've just released a, a facial oil in the last 12 months that's becoming really popular. But I didn't realize before I was a saffron farmer that um, it's used in a lot of cosmetics that, that are um, skin smoothing and um, it's very calming to the skin. It's very high in antioxidants. So it's a pretty amazing spice. And of course, used religiously throughout um, the world and to dye clothing. Traditional monks still um, dye their robes using saffron. So, you know, it's a pretty diverse uh, spice, really. Um, my favorite thing to cook with saffron that is tough, but um, I, a saffron, a good Basque saffron cheesecake is probably my favorite thing that I only allow myself to cook about once or twice a year. <laughs> it gets eaten in about 24 hours. The vivid crimson stigma and styles called threads are collected and dried, but as Angela explains, the process is meticulous. And the first question we get is, why is it so expensive? It's so expensive because everything's done by hand. So, um, so we hand plant every corm. Saffron is a corm or a bulb, um, and they're all hand planted. We currently have around 120,000 bulbs in the ground. Um, and then about six weeks a year, it's it flowers, and we hand pick all of those flowers. So every morning we go up at about 6 a.m. before the sun hits the flowers, and we pick every single flower. I think our biggest day this year was um, 13,000 flowers in a morning and we pick them all and then we bring them inside and we gently hand pluck the three little red stigmas out of the centre of the flower and that's what the saffron is. Yeah, so we dry a little bit differently to certainly I'd say any other um, saffron grower in Australia and probably mostly in the world. Um, We dry with humidity. Um, so we dry, most saffron farmers would dry in food dehydrators um, and in commercial big food dehydrators, which we did for our first year or two and, and got really good saffron. But we then um, met another local grower um, who whose saffron was just so amazing. It smelt, looked, tasted different to any I've ever seen. And they wouldn't tell me how they did it. <laughs> and... Um, and then eventually they, they actually sold up and we bought a lot of their stock and, and part of the deal was they told me what they were doing. Um, so I won't tell you exactly what we do, but but essentially we dry in conventional ovens and we introduce water into the oven um, to create humidity. And um, industrial chemists will explain it in that it, it the humidity coats the stigma of the um, saffron and that locks in immediately all the colour and content and taste and smell um, and then dries it very quickly from within. Um, so we dry, yeah, like probably in a, in a quarter of the time to most other farmers. Um, and, yeah, we, we're really finding that that's made a huge difference. Customers who've been using our saffron since we started have said in the last two years it's, it's so much stronger and the, the – particularly the aroma is a lot stronger and the colour. So, yeah, it's been an interesting change. After a lot of back-breaking ground preparation, they hand-planted their first saffron in 2018, which yielded just 10 grams of saffron. It was at that moment they realised why it's such a valuable product. Look, I think there's a lot of challenges in growing saffron and continues to be. We're still so young in the process and still learning um but certainly i guess uh that you can't control the environment the only thing that really affects saffron or can kill saffron is too much uh rain so too much moisture and we've certainly had that this year so we unfortunately think we've lost maybe up to 50 percent of our crop this year or of our stock this year which is a huge challenge for us um, so that's something, you know, we, we're going to have to learn from and change a few things. Of course, like I said, you can't, can't control um, the weather, unfortunately, but we will trial some different ways when we replant this year. Um, but, yeah, that, that's been a huge challenge, keeping our saffron dry in a very wet season. Um, but also, I guess, just like when you start anything new, 
I don't know. I think we panic over little things that we see and we don't know whether that's right or wrong. So you try different things and some of them work and some of them don't. But, yeah, learning, just learning um, is both one of the biggest challenges and also one of the biggest joys, I think. A lot of people know saffron as a spice, but few realise it comes from a flower. Angela believes its unique properties make it more versatile than many realise. Probably the most common comment, definitely actually, the most common comment we get is, yeah, I know what saffron is, but I don't really know how to use it. Um, um, so my advice is just just use it in a few simple things like saffron rice. So anything that has a stock, so even if you're just cooking rice with boiling water as you normally would or absorption, just to add a couple of strands of saffron into the mix or steep it in stock before you use it in a soup or in a curry um, and just use it as you would stock or water in a dish. And probably before I was a saffron farmer, that's about all I would have um, thought to use saffron in was rice and curry. But now I actually use it um, a lot more in baking. So I tend to tell people that saffron um, goes so well with dairy. So I make saffron custard for my kids at least once a week. So just add a little bit of saffron into some milk to steep and then use it to make custard or scones or any, uh, cakes, any form of baking or, yeah, dairy base, so cheesecakes, things like that. Saffron's wonderful with. Life on the farm is idyllic, but it's hard yakka. The commitment required has changed Angela's perceptions of life as a farmer. We've learnt perseverance and grit, I would say, are the two things that are consistent in our lives since growing saffron. Um, perseverance in that, yeah, we, we've had losses this year with rain and because we love it, you just get up and you just keep going. Um, you will go up there like I did yesterday for two and a half hours and weed half a row and I'll go up there in two weeks and most of it will be back and I'll start again. So... Um, yeah, you you certainly learn to persevere and to keep going and have a lot of grit and particularly in harvest season, obviously, um, you know, you pick all those 13,000 flowers and get it all done and sit all day and do that and then you go up in the morning and they're all there again, which is a wonderful thing we love. But, you know, it, it absolutely takes commitment to keep going. Um, yeah, and then this year we we you pull up saffron every three and a half years. Um, so this year, in about six weeks, in fact, we start the process, which is hand lifting all those one hundred and twenty thousand corms, and we'll separate them all out by hand and clean them and check them, and then <laughs> maybe not with head torches. I'm hoping this time, but um, we we will hand plant them into new ground. It always has to be into new ground every three and a half years. So grit and perseverance is is what you need a lot of. Angela and her husband, Brendan, changed their lives to take the deep dive into a life growing saffron. And although they've already garnered recognition, they're just getting started. What's next for us is scale. So um, we have sold out nearly um, this year and our, our, um, our harvest only finished just at the sort of mid-May this year and we've just about sold out this year so that's pretty quick um, which is a beautiful thing um, but of course we want to keep everyone happy and we love producing it so um, we're about to invest in more corns this year um, when we replant to scale up and also um, to be honest, we we want to be full-time saffron farmers. So Brendan and I both still work full-time in day jobs and um, and that, we're very lucky to do that to keep us ticking along. But we would love in the next sort of five years to think that saffron was our main pursuit or certainly for, for one of us. So, yeah, scale's our next thing. And probably um, thinking a bit more about exporting, um, we – getting a lot of interest particularly from Asia um, but we just haven't sort of pushed down that path yet just again due to scale and, and quantities but we'll certainly look at that as we start to get a little bit bigger and produce more 
Um, and the third thing, which actually I haven't talked about really, but um, this year we're going to, well, sorry, next year in 2022, we're going to trial doing some aeroponic saffron, so uh, growing growing corms or sitting corms in racks um, without soil. Um, it's been done a little bit over in Iran and um, experimented with, so and particularly uh, in the in the medicinal arena. So saffron being used for um, medicinal purposes, it needs to be a little more highly controlled and the environment and the climate and how it's handled. So, and we think there's a big opportunity there. So. We, we're going to trial that a little bit just with a few thousand corms next year and just just see whether that can work for us. The farm change has had a positive impact on the Argyles. The connection of taking something from seed to plate has brought a greater sense of purpose. I just think um, that we've truly found something that we really love and um, I, it, it's really one of the hardest, certainly one of the hardest physical jobs I've ever had. And I just see no end to that. I hope I'm doing it until I can no longer bend over and pick the flowers. So I think, and, and as I was talking about before, from that absolute start of from nothing, no knowledge, head torches on with a newborn baby in the house in bed to now... I think you realise when you do something like that, the impact, um, when it succeeds, when you come up with a product that's beautiful and everyone's enjoying and um, that that's just so encouraging and so exciting and, you know, it's just amazing to get up and really feel like you've built something. So I think it's changed our lives in that way. Um, and... It's in practical ways, you know, I still work, I actually work in um, financial services and I still contract back into Sydney. So half the day I sit in the office and tap away on my computer and then the other half I put my boots on and I go up into the paddock and get dirty and that's such a beautiful balance. Like I think the 20 years I was working, you know, in very stressful jobs in corporate Sydney, um, I look back now and go, wow, if only I was allowed out in the dirt for two hours a day, it would have made such a difference. So I just think the balance, the balance of life is a lot, uh, I won't say easier, but um, a bit more zen, I'd say, I suppose, in our day to day. And of course, living in a regional area um, now and being farmers brings with it um, benefits, especially in this environment where operating in now, we feel very lucky to have wide open spaces and to be doing what we're doing. Everyone asks me what, especially my colleagues from back in Sydney who are used to seeing me in suits and makeup every day, still sort of are in disbelief that I'm a saffron farmer and why do I love it so much and why am I <laughs> putting myself through the hard physical work that is being a saffron farmer? And I've really, I just don't have an answer other than um, it's just a pleasing thing to do. Like, well, in terms of even as a, a farming pursuit, like I said, I grew up on a on a cattle and a sheep and a crop farm, but and I never loved that. I loved the childhood, but that to me was a bit like I don't know, hard work and cattle and running around and getting hot and flustered. Whereas. Even though it's early mornings and very manual, you get up early when it's all peaceful and lovely and you pick these beautiful flowers that smell beautiful and then you come and sit inside and have a cup of tea and listen to music and <laughs> strip the saffron. It's very, um, yeah, it's it's quite meditative. So when we, when we get um, workers in each year to help us, we usually get a couple of people to come and do harvest with us. They all just love it because I think it's that. It's almost, yeah, like sitting doing a jigsaw puzzle. You just sit and do it. And I think that's really part of it. I just love that, the nature of what it is to produce saffron. In just five years, Angela and Brendan are not only producing some of the best saffron in the world, but are living proof that belief, grit and determination fosters the most fruitful outcomes. This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production 
I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of producers, farmers, makers and growers, the true lifeblood of the food industry. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or email us at producerspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au.